back it up. <laughs> uh, genuinely, thank you for being here. Um, I'm just incredibly grateful for everyone who's in the crowd, and I'm there for and deciding to start with my acknowledgments because I think some people end with acknowledgments, and no one's really paying attention at that point. But I would like to start with mine because I am incredibly grateful for. All of the humans in this room for being here, all my students, and it's really nice to see students from my classes, so thank you guys for showing up. And of course, all my family, um, who is both my blood family as well as my chosen family. So, uh, first of all, thanks to all of my family, my mom and my dad, and my stepmom, and my brother and my sister-in-law all visited me at some point during my <laughs> during my sabbatical trip. So I was essentially living in London for two months, and I got a lot of visitors, and that made it easier in some ways, and harder in others. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to also thank Big Ben and Joelle for the support. Um, I, I can't even imagine uh, working in another job where I have this kind of opportunity to spend that kind of time abroad and to have the both financial support as well as the support of all the uh, individuals of the institution who made it happen. So of course that means the board of trustees, the math science division, uh, the chemistry department in particular, um, and then of course all the students and all the faculty and staff that have been supported in all of the ways, including personal financial donations to things and telling me all these neat things and Jen McCarthy for teaching me French so that I could uh, at least model my way through when I was in Paris for a bit. And uh, of course, some funding sources, which um, really just alleviated all of it. So the other thing that I wanted to say is just a heartfelt thank you to the Passion Project Showcase Committee. Um, everything that they've done uh, to make this happen is there's just so much hard work that goes on behind the scenes. And this group of staff really made it happen. So all of these types are really making this kind of project happen and making this uh, potential to be able to share out about this kind of work possible. And I think we need more excuses to celebrate uh, each other and ourselves. So uh, thank you all. Um, and give yourselves a break. So I went to a, a, a conference in October and And it's probably not a very organized talk. And I was like, yeah, I like that. I, this isn't going to be a very organized talk, but I did have an outline slide. So that's that's it. It's just it's a little bit of organized chaos. Every time I would talk to someone about, oh, I'm just not really sure what I'm going to say and what stories I want to tell, um, they're like, you know, you're just going to get up there and wing it, like you do with everything. I'm like, I'm kind of organized. <laughs> uh, fortunately, I got to be in England during the coronation incredibly important and historic event. Um, the passing of Queen Elizabeth definitely left a void in terms of London and England and the kind of rise and presence of King Charles and all of the hoopla leading up to the coronation was um, exceptional to be around. It was pretty amazing to see and all the flags and all the, the national sports. And of course, there's still, especially the young people, that are sort of like, that's the monarchy, which I kind of understand, but it was sort of interesting to um, to see all the hubbub. So I, I have a couple pictures of the coronation kind of events throughout. One of my favorite things that I did coronation-wise was I went to Burlington House, which is where the Royal Society of Chemistry is, the Royal Astronomical Society, the Linnaean Society, and uh, the Royal Antiquities Society are all in the same building or building complex. And I got to go to the Royal Astronomical Society and made my own crown and with circuits, right? So like I got to light up circuits and I have a picture of that a little bit later. So that was kind of delightful. And then they also had some like, historical reenactments taking notes on this. And uh, I had scones of cloud cream there for the first time at the Royal Society of Chemistry. So that was kind of exciting too to, to be in the space. The Royal Society of Chemistry has been kind of a passion of mine to be involved in. And it's similar to our American Chemical Society here, but it's much more, it has much more of a history that's rooted in, in a long tradition of an interest in science. So I'm excited to talk about that a little bit. So a little bit of background about me before I guess I get into my trip. 
Um, I, I like that Sarah B said that I collect bachelor's degrees. That is true. Yes, um, I have three of them. Um, I started my Bachelor of Arts in World Languages with specialization in Spanish. So I was really interested in being able to speak a couple languages. And that was sort of my focus when I first started my undergrad career. So I really wanted to be able to speak multiple languages. I figured the career part out later, right? <laughs> the, other, the other degrees would come. I'd figure out what I needed to be successful. Um, it's still a work in progress, I think. <laughs> that's, the, that's the take on message there. I also got my Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry. So I know that's kind of a weird thing to say that I didn't get a Bachelor of Science, but I didn't get a Bachelor of Arts. It's a little bit less intensive in terms of physics and some of the, um, some of the classes along the way, even though I still took physics, of course, and a lot of math classes. So I got my Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry just to get out of there a little bit sooner because I got my Bachelor of Science in Biology, which is something that not a lot of people know about me because I usually keep food. Because <laughs> then I have to explain things in Biology. So I usually am like, oh, no, I'm a chemist. I don't know anything about biology. <laughs> it's also so pretty <laughs> So uh, the other parts of my education that I wanted to highlight, because when we're talking about things that I'm passionate about, um, languages, of course, is one of them. Science is one of them. And then I'm also really passionate about history and philosophy. And that came about in no small part because of an honors program that I did called the William Hill Douglas Honors Program in Central Washington. University. So my degrees are from CWU, I still live in Allensburg, and um, it was essentially a four-year grade books program. So we essentially read a book a week for four years, and we had colloquia where we get together and we discuss them, we would write papers on them. And so a lot of the reading that I've done, um, not just kind of the Western canon, and thinking critical to that way, but it's also um, some of the different Middle Eastern philosophies and some of the religious contexts. Kind of all of that comes about because of my experiences in the honors program. And I'm so very grateful for that. And I really wanted to incorporate more the philosophy of science and history of science in my, my master's program. And I asked the faculty if I could use this graduate level philosophy of science class as an elective. And they said, no. And I didn't like that. You know, I thought that was very short sighted of them, actually. Um, so, of course, I took other things and still got a master's degree and I'm not quick to or anything. But one of the things that I've always been passionate about then is doing that kind of learning on the side, the stuff that maybe scientists don't always perceive the value of, which is, again, short sighted. It's ridiculous. So, the other thing that I did was a science science program. Yeah, I have my degrees. I like a wall full of certificates. That was the plan, actually, that I was going to have. Three bachelor's degrees, two master's degrees, and a PhD. That was the plan. It might still be the plan, so then it's a career thing. That was the vision. So um, the science honors program was research based, and I, I did a lot of research as an undergraduate, and I just really loved to be able to do so in such a small program. And that really fed into the research that I did as a graduate student. And I, um, I really got a, a lot of nice opportunities. When I got my master's, though, I wasn't a full-time student. It took me five years to do it. So I tell you that just in terms of that, hopefully as an inspiration. I was working full-time and doing my master's degree part-time. So I was keeping kind of uh, vampire hours in the lab. Um, and I come in after hours, I come in on weekends. And I was working as a secretary of the World Languages Department. So I actually got a chance to be around all these different languages all the time and interacting with the students from the World Languages Department. And I did a lot of advising during that time. I got to know the students. I still have relationships with a lot of the students from that time. And, um, and faculty as well. So I got to be kind of immersed in this nice culture of learning. I feel like I got to learn how to be an academic during that time. And then I also got to do the grad, the grad research, which the chemistry is obviously a passion of mine as well. Now, I kind of tripped and fell into my teaching job. That wasn't really the plan, was to teach. So that just makes it even more special to be standing here in front of you today and kind of talking about the journey a little bit. Um, but I started teaching here in the fall of 2013. So I'm just starting into my 11th year of teaching here, as Steve Bauer said. And I took my sabbatical on the last spring, much to my students' chagrin, 
time because I ditched them the third quarter without really telling them. And I have a series class, so my four series students are still mad. <laughs> a couple of them are knocking their heads off the audience right now. <laughs> so I, um, that was challenging um, in a lot of ways. It was challenging on the department, it was challenging on the division, it was challenging on my students. It's hard to find someone to come and teach a chemistry class. Just for months late, got the population <laughs> just to cover that. So I, again, just more gratitude for being able to do it. So the goal of my sabbatical was to go and research. I've never been to Europe before. And so to, to kind of learn about some of the history that I just studied with folks and to be in the spaces where the science was actually happening. So it's really neat to get some of these labs, it's neat to get some of the spaces where some of these scientists had inhabited and really get to get a feel for what that looked like and felt like. So that was a big deal because then I'm going to be teaching this course in the spring, which I'm very excited about, to kind of tell them a little more of the stories in more detail. So I'm kind of doing a big picture overview here, um, and if you're interested, you can pause this time. Now, as part of all of my varied uh, academic experience, I like higher ed a lot. I love the academy. I love being an academic. And a lot of that came about because of the various great opportunities that I've had. And in some ways, I feel like I've kind of made for myself, which I'm very proud of. I think that um, most of the actual international travel that I've ever done has been through academia in some way, shape, or form. In 2010, I went to Mexico, the group um, that's the director who's um, Crouch down there, Dr. Raymond Paul of the Africana and Black Studies program at Central Washington University. And I sort of talked my way into being secretarial support and uh, Spanish interpreter for that. So that's a little big work, which is pretty awesome. And then got a couple weeks off of work to be able to go down and actually use the Spanish in the context, which was amazing. Was the goal of that trip was to study the folklore of the people there in the food two weeks ago. And um, so we go into people's homes and they teach us folk remedies for things. I, I got a really bad sunburn because if you look at that picture, you can see kind of the bright, shining light that is my skin in the middle of <laughs> some very beautiful people. Um, and I was not anticipating the sunburn that I would get. So I, um, I was topless at one point in someone's home and they were slathering me up with something that they had cooked on the stove that they had from plants in their backyard. So um, that kind of experience, you just can't get. You just can't get that at home, right? <laughs> so that was 2010. In 2011, I was, I was a grad school teacher. I, um, I went to Japan as part of my uh, graduate studies. My advisor is an amazing human in a very small field we're solid state chemists. We kind of look at materials that have technological kind of means, and he's very well known in that field, so he always gets invited to international conferences. So I told him, I walked into his office at the beginning of the year, and I'm like, okay, two things. This is my fifth year doing this. So, one, this has to be my last year doing this. And two, you're going to get invited to an international conference, and I want you to take you. So that's, uh, he got invited to two places that year, India and Japan, and I ended up getting to go to Japan, which was amazing. So I did a presentation there, um, and he did a presentation there, and I ended up getting an award for my poster, which was um, pretty exceptional, pretty exciting. So that was pretty neat. And again, I was a student, and still just, I was a secretary in the World Language Department. That was my, that was my job. That's what I, that's who I was. And so, um, a couple years later than I had the job at Japan. So kind of neat. And then this is me. Mom took that, actually. Um, so, and mom's in the audience. The Queen Mother is in attendance. <laughs> yes. 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 Good. I, I, what I love about having mom on campus, obviously, and this talks about, it's another one of my passions, obviously, is community and building relationships with people. but. Um, I love that people stop mom on campus and they're like, you're Lindsay's mom. <laughs> they may never met her before, but they, they know. I love that. Okay, so then I got the chance to do this battle, 
And I flew into Heathrow in London and was there for a few days and ended up going to Scotland in my first week, which was pretty amazing. So I spent some time in Edinburgh. And um, I would love to go back to Scotland and didn't spend more time there, but I would love to. But the majority of the time, I had a flat there for the whole time in London. So that was nice to have some home base and use that um, to travel from. So um, this has sort of always been my problem. If you look at my undergraduate catalog, it is so dog-eared and highlighted. And But then I can do this, and if I take this one more class, then I can an English minor and a political sciences minor, and I can do a lot of that stuff I can do a lot of that stuff I can I can do a um, math minor, also, philosophy, like I have all, I have all this mapped out. So it did take me five years to do my undergrad also, and I was taking summer classes all the time. But yeah, so um, my interests have always been varied, and I think that uh, one of the nice things about being an academic is we always get to learn. So when I think about the things that I'm passionate about, uh, lifelong learning is definitely one of them, and trying to foster that, trying to foster that interest in creativity and curiosity in my students is really important, too. So while I was there, that's Paris. That's her move. Um, Mom took that one, too. She's across from the table from me. Um, I think I ended up with and that's the Gutenberg Bible, right? Um, so that's neat. <laughs> and I saw Phantom of the Opera in the theater where it originally opened. Wow. And so that was amazing. And it's, it was called, when I first got to London, it was called Her Majesty's Theater. And by the time that Mom and I went to Phantom of the Opera, they changed all of the signage like overnight when the coronation happened. And now it's His Majesty's. So, I mean, think about the longevity of Elizabeth's reign, how long it is Her Majesty's Theater, and now it is His Majesty's Theater, which is where I saw it. And then how much money they would have had to put in all, like, all of the signage and all the things. I was like looking all over the place. Now, uh, I guess you can think about science. <laughs> that was weird. But historically, I mean, the science, didn't have to choose, right? You could be this kind of Renaissance human, which I think is sort of fun. Uh, uh, the original term for science is kind of this natural philosopher, which comes uh, from a lot of these big ideas that people would have about things. Science in the early years was very much, I think this is how this works based on these very limited observations, right? I've never left the city that I grew up. I've made small observations. I should publish a book which I think is um, uh, the amount of imposter syndrome that I feel just even standing up here, <laughs> looking back and studying some of these people that are like, you know what I think happens with the sun? <laughs> like, I just think, I, I've seen it, you know? I, I just think that's amazing, you know? And I, I, all of the academics I know feel the same way in terms of like the imposter syndrome that we have about, but what if they find out that I don't know everything about this? <laughs> they're like, now I'll just publish it, it'll be fine. Um, there were chemists pretty early on, they used to spell chemists with Y, which I always kind of like. Uh, Robert Boyle published The Skeptical Chemist, that's uh, C-H-Y-M-I-S-T. Yeah, the Y in place of the E, not in place of the N, kind of weird. Physicists have been around for a long time, kind of studying the physical nature of things. Naturalists, of course, and the botanists and the herbologists. Um, medicine has a long tradition of being linked with science folks. I did a lot of study of the history of medicine, um, including places like cemeteries, where they have these mort safes so over along the graves so that people wouldn't grave rob to get the body parts so they could study more things, right? So early times, simpler times. Um, <laughs> mathematicians, linguists, when we think of the science of language and the study of the patterns of language, um, I think that's maybe why it's been so appealing. I love putting the puzzles, and I think that that's, that's kind of along the same thing. As an aside, though, my mom, when I was in, uh, when I was freshman in college, this is right around the time that CSI Las Vegas came out. And so I, I remember distinctly being in the dorm, and she kind of like woke me up in the middle of the night. And it was uh, myself, my work cell phone, so this is probably actually more like this. 
and cell phone in the middle of the night. And, uh, and she was like, I know what you're going to be when you grow up. <laughs> I saw this show. <laughs> and she saw this episode where they had to put together a sliding glass door, like piece by piece, to figure out the, the impact point. Does anyone that seen it? I've seen some naughty, you're like, I know that episode. <laughs> so she saw that episode and she's like, I know what you're going to do for the rest of your life. You're going to be a forensic scientist. And so that was the plan for a little bit. And I still love talking about forensic science for the same ways. But yeah, so what were you Artists. <laughs> a lot of good science and art when we think about things like painting and the, the paint itself, the ceramic glazes. There's a lot of chemistry there. Um, astronomy has been around for a very long time. Um, and looking up again, the Carl Sagan quote being absolutely appropriate when we look up and marvel at the stars and then can see ourselves in them because we are made of the same stuff. It's pretty amazing. Um, alchemy, of course, has led to chemistry. A lot of the fathers of modern chemistry were really alchemists, so this kind of transition from alchemy to chemistry and, and what were the features and parts of that. And then magic. So I did a manuscript class when I was there to study medieval manuscripts. And a lot of the science texts that we read were really by magicians. And they would call themselves that. So you know, we think of like sleight of hand, prestidigitation kind of things. That's a good use of the word. Thank you. Thank you. I used the term jaunty in, in class the other day. And someone was like, that was the exact use for that one. I don't know language. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the history of science. That what I like about it, kind of the history, is they didn't have to choose. It wasn't so siloed. We think about the different disciplines now and think of them as so separated, but they really were just so interconnected. And not just the science, what we consider now the science disciplines, but the humanities disciplines, the arts, thinking about social sciences and kind of the way that the patterns of human behavior that they look at, it's just all so intertwined, and it's always been so intertwined in my mind that, um, yeah, I think it's almost a shame that, that uh, we don't have more opportunities to do these kinds of independent research and work. Um, this statue is actually at the British Library. It's called Newton, after Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton is um, kind of the hero of London, uh, hero of England for sure. In terms of science, I'll show you some photos a little bit later. First, it comes from scantia, from Latin, which means knowledge and awareness and understanding, which I think you could also define something like philosophy in the same way, right? It's a way that we do know things, it's a way we understand things, it's an awareness of things. The first usage of it in that context was in the 14th century, which is actually pretty early, especially because there wasn't really a formalized discipline. One of the things that I love about science is it's not just this is the body of knowledge that makes up all science, but it's also the method by which we understand it. So it's also a verb as well as a noun. So I like that about science. Um, and it didn't always mean that, of course. The scientific method, though, wasn't discovered. Wasn't discovered. <laughs> it and I was like, it. <laughs> it wasn't formalized at the time that the term science was used. <laughs> I think I'm going to teach it now, right now on. And then children, on the, on the scientific method, this was good. Okay, anyway, <laughs> prior to, and very early on, they called themselves natural philosophers. And again, this comes from the idea of the, the big ideas, the, uh, the kind of abstract thinking, looking for patterns and things and being able to explain patterns and learning um, and how we know what we know, questioning all that knowledge that came from looking at the natural world. So of course the big names then, uh, Charles Darwin along with Isaac Newton, uh, the blue plaques are on houses, they're on businesses, any place that any, some famous person has like, laid a hand, there's a blue plaque. Um, so I was always on blue plaque missions, and there was always like a neighborhood that I was looking for to find a blue plaque. It's on some like apartment complex these days, which is kind of fun. I think that's neat. So near the University of London, Charles Darwin had a flat um, and lived there for a bit, 
And so this was the blue plaque from right around the University of London. Uh, the photo above is the bust. You can't see it very well with the way that this light is hitting it, but it's his bust from Westminster, where he's buried. Westminster Abbey. This is this middle one is actually one that I used in my chemistry 105 class, which is a chemical concepts class. I do a presentation on Robert Boyle, who is one of the fathers of modern chemistry. He's also famous for his work with gases. He looked at the relationship between volume and pressure in gases, and that's it. And I've always used a picture of that painting in a presentation that I, I use in that class. And so I was kind of flipping through my photos, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to jazz up my presentation a little bit, use some of my stuff for research. And I was like, oh, yeah, I have a picture of that painting. I thought that was kind of fun. This is from the Science Museum in London. And then this is Alexander Fleming, Dr. Alexander Fleming, from a church in the Paddington area. Um, how often do you see a scientist in stained glass? I think that that's kind of delightful. So there was a window that was blown out during World War II. So kind of thinking about the history of things. World War II and the bombings in England were um, incredibly impactful. Uh, that's you know understatement of the year. But that particular window was blown out, and they decided to replace it with a bunch of famous parishioners. So there was also a picture next to Dr. Blumey of Peter Pan, because J.M. Barry also lived in that same area. So the author who wrote Peter Pan. And then, of course, I just love this. I mean, if you look at the detail of his lab space that is in the glass, that's what it looks like. Because I've been in that lab space, right? <laughs> that's the actual, I can recognize that distinctively. So whoever made this actually was in the space, and definitely wanted to do justice. So Dr. Fleming is the person who discovered penicillin. And he did that by um, leaving his samples while he went on vacation for a couple of weeks. And he came back and found it growing. And he was like, well, what is this? And he happened to have a lab space that's above the mycology department. So they think that some combination of the weather during that time, maybe some spores that were around, I mean, serendipity, whatever all came together. They have a hard time now trying to recreate the experiment, like to make it happen under the same kinds of conditions. They have a hard time doing it. So I just think that there's, there's a little bit of magic to it. There's a little bit of serendipity to it. And that's kind of a lovely thing. Now, you can't have famous scientists without having the stories around them. And the stories around them are sometimes true and sometimes exaggerated. So this is probably one of the most famous trees in scientific history. Right? If you sit under it and an apple falls on your head, right? then you have discovered gravity. right? <laughs> it wasn't there before. Now you've discovered it, much like the scientific method. Right? <laughs> so that is the tree. I'm in Cambridge here, and this is just outside Trinity College. And so that is allegedly the tree that Isaac Newton sat under when he uh, had the apple on his head. So I think it's kind of fun to tell the stories. I think it's fun to sort of engage in some of that. One of my other favorites is Dmitry Mendeleev, who's a Ukrainian scientist, Russian scientist, who uh, is the father of the periodic table. And his mythology is, oh, he's thinking about the elements, and we have on cards, and he was, you know, fell asleep at his desk. He's like his students, he's cramming the night before the test, right? Trying to figure out uh, what the periodic table looks like, or kind of a race to it at that point. And uh, he fell asleep and he came to him in a dream, right? <laughs> I love those kinds of things. Discovery Benzene is like that, too. Uh, Isaac Newton, of course, being uh, one of the most famous scientists to come out of England, he was definitely a polymath, uh, just had a lot of different interests, a lot of different scientific interests, and uh, mathematical as well. Um, so when we see kind of the tribute to him, that's his tribute at Westminster Abbey. So compare Darwin's picture of space, Isaac Newton, shrine to Isaac Newton. <laughs> so that's me in front of Isaac Newton's grave, as well as uh, J.J. Thompson and Ernest Rutherford, who discovered the electron and the proton, respectively. 
they're all buried in that same area. Another one that's a little more famous is Stephen Hawking, who is also buried there. Um, and that's pretty neat then to kind of be in the space um, where our famous scientists are currently are from. But where are the women, you ask? Well, a lot of our stories, um, of course, are going to involve the women of science, and women have always been involved in science. And I think it's one of the untold stories. I was hoping to get a lot of um, interesting behind the scenes kind of stuff. A lot of the times, famous scientists would have a scientist's wife also, who was actively doing research alongside her husband, or enhancing his research, or in the case of Marie Curie, he was enhancing hers and kind of gave up things in order for him to, um, in order for him to have a space to work. So, uh, the me looking really delighted with myself is in front of Marie Curie's office. This is at the Radium Institute in Paris. That is her lab space down at the bottom, kind of looking through the door, like leaning over the tape <laughs> so that I could see. I was just sitting in there the whole time, and then I started to take all these, you know, selfies and try to look really cool, like, oh yeah, I'm just in Marie Curie's space, but I didn't see it. And I just looked like. <laughs> Uh, like a kid in a candy store in all of these pictures. So that's actually the most subdued one that I can find. <laughs> um, I wanted to emphasize, though, and this never happened in a man's lab, but if you look at uh, her research space there, what you maybe can't tell because of the quality of the photo, is if you look in the back, there's kind of a mannequin, and there's a dress that's in her lab. So that upper picture is kind of uh, zoomed in on the dress, and I like to talk about Marie Curie's dress, which she always wore dark clothes, which as you can see from the cutout, Marie Curie has been running around campus and been hanging out in her library for the last couple of quarters. Um, she always wore this kind of dark blue that's a distinctive dress, and actually the one that she's wearing there is probably that one, just without kind of the lazy bit. It's her wedding dress. <laughs> and uh, she, when she was done, uh, she's the most practical person in the world, which I love. She's like, you know what, I'm not going to waste the rest. You know, they do like the rack the rest kind of thing these days, but then you like put it away and it's pristine. She's like, I need something to wear in the lab, right? <laughs> and so she used to wear her wedding dress in the lab as her lab. That's like the lab pose, actually. Which <laughs> I just think it's delightful. So I love seeing pictures of her injury in that dress, because she's always in that dress, and if you look at pictures of her from now on, you'll be like, I'm just in that dress. It's in her lab. And that's Marie and Pierre, again, just outside the Radium Institute, very close to the Pasteur Institute. Also, they're on the same kind of campus. Um, Rosalind Franklin, another important scientist. She's a little bit more modern. Um, in the 1900s, she worked with Watson Crick. Um, they work with and sort of Heavy air quotes, <laughs> but uh, she was she did the X-ray crystallography and took the famous photo, uh, photo 51 of the DNA double helix, and so they figured out the shape of the double helix based on her research. There's a lot of controversy about that film because they apparently used her data without her knowledge and. We're sharing it around with other folks. So the three people that got the Nobel Prize for the DNA double helix, Watson, Crick, and Maurice Wilkins, who is her boss. Oh. Yeah. So much for house too. That's what you can say. A lot of love for Rosalind Franklin. The other thing about that is she couldn't have gotten the Nobel Prize at the time because she had already passed away working with X-rays as part of one's body. And so the X-ray crystallography process of course, has some, if you look at her dates, again, you probably can't see it in the photo, but it's 1920 to 1958. It's a very short life, lifespan. And she lived there during that time, the last bit of her life. And it was actually near the neighborhood. It was a walkable distance from where I was staying in my flat, which was kind of, that was kind of special. It was neat to go and like, hmm, it was a awesome time. Uh, in the picture above, when I was talking about going to the Burlington House and going to the Royal Astronomical Society, another important astronomer was Carolyn Herschel. She's the sister of William Herschel. And uh, they did this adorable historical reenactment where they were like full on in character. 
and just like bustling you around you know, to get to the different places and the activities. And so Carolyn Herschel is um, incredibly important in terms of, um, she found hundreds of stars and published about it, um, different locations of the stars. William Herschel is known for his discovery of Uranus. He didn't know it was a planet at the time, but um, Uranus. Um, and they bickered like brother and sister. And it was really cute then. And so the person who's standing next to them is the current director of the Royal Astronomical Society, who's also there and kind of walking in to ask and answer questions. And William Herschel has a beef with um, Isaac Newton, who published some of his data at the time, again, without his knowledge, and kind of used it in a different way. And so you can compare. They have these side-by-side -side manuscripts of Newton's work and William Herschel's work. And you can see the places where the data was just like obviously lifted. And so Herschel got pissed off and burned one of his books. So there's like only a couple of the books left over, and they have one in the Royal Astronomical Society. Which when they say women are too emotional to be, you know, kind of just <laughs> saying. Okay, so then we talked a little bit about the history of the word science and sort of the development a little bit. Maybe a little bit of the word about scientists in general. So uh, there's always been a label about people that study the specific disciplines. People that study chemistry as chemist, uh, physics as a physicist, all that good stuff. But um, there's one woman that's not very well known, I think, perhaps, um, and that's Mary Somerville. Mary Somerville, also kind of a polymath, uh, she's a writer, she studied astronomy, she was definitely involved in physics, mathematician. She's uh, incredible, and uh, I love this quote from her obituary. Whatever difficulty we might experience in the middle of the 19th century in choosing a king of science, there would be no question who the queen is, and of course referring to Mary Somerville. So I think that's kind of fascinating, and of course predates then people like Marie Curie, Ross, and Brad, than the ones that we just talked about. She was definitely more of a contemporary, um, Carolyn Herschel was created Mary Somerville and definitely got less press than she did. And so when she wrote the book on the connection, it's hard to say what it is, like that, on the connection of the physical sciences, which was in 1834, there was a man who reviewed it and he used the term scientist in print for the first time. And so the term scientist has always then been associated with a woman because you can't call her a man of science, right? So a scientist has always been inherently female. So I think that we should call all male scientists male scientists from now on. <laughs> I like Mary Somerville a lot, and they actually, in Scotland, on Scottish pounds, uh, put her on the money. I think that one of the delightful things about European currency is that it has people like authors and poets and scientists right on the money. Uh, Darwin was on the British pounds pretty recently, and Mary Somerville is on the Scottish pounds that were just released um, about 10 years ago, 10, 15 years. Scotland's much more on the British pound these days. You know, they've been all things over there, but I really, I actually went out and bought some of those, and Mary Somerville and I, and they bought her some back, so it's cool. <laughs> So what's next then? The history that we're in, the history that we're living, um, the Science 105, History 105 class I'm very excited to teach. It can be either a natural sciences elective or a social sciences elective that will be offered in the spring. I'm going to do a lot more storytelling in there. And in there, we're going to talk a lot about the science as well. I'm going to geek out about that other part of my passion, which is the science itself and a little less of the storytelling. Um, I had started a blog when I was in there which is lucidoscience.com, and I'm going to continue writing in that blog as I'm preparing the materials for the course in the spring. So um, if you are interested, please check it out. I will be putting up some new content, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, for sure in December, kind of as I'm starting to think about the future course. So I'm really excited to get back to writing. I really love it. I, I was looking at my journal and kind of preparation, so I did a travel journal. I almost was like, I should just read this travel journal, because past is hilarious. But I um, had this travel journal while I was, I was there, and I was reading through it, and I'm like, I'm really, I, like, I've said that a lot in it. It's like, 
Thank you. 